Welcome to our Snooker Trick Shot Countdown. Now the World Snooker Trick Shot Championships brought together the best in the business as we entertained the crowds with a dazzling array of tricks. In an effort to win the trophy, players developed routines, introduced props, got the audience involved and tricks became more complicated as we competed for the best score. We had to perfect compulsory tricks, win the audience cheers on the clapometer, battle against the heat and bugs in Sun City, South Africa, and take on some of the most daring shots seen on a snooker table. This is your chance to see the highlights. The snooker trick shots was a great show and not only involved a display of skill from us professionals, but a degree of wit and showmanship to boot. I ended up winning the World Trick Shot Championships three times, not due to the quality of the shots, but more that my best mate Barry Hearn used to be a judge in the early years. And when the players started to complain about this and demanded the introduction of the clapometer, Barry then moved the event to my hometown of Brentwood. So we'll be counting down to see which shot is classed the best of all and be hearing from a few of these famous faces along the way. Within every great sportsman, he's an entertainer trying to get out. The gags work funny, at least if the trick shot works, you get a round of applause. When they see a trick shot, they say, wow. Uh, is it true? I, you know, it's impossible to do this. Many things is good in the life, but the, uh, laugh is one of the most important things. And I believe uh, that is a show that makes you laugh and see a nice shot. It really basically came down to who could be the funniest on the night. And I mean, they've all got their own characters in, in different ways, with joke telling or, or the shots or the way they set it up. And it really, really came down to the entertainment value. So we begin with one of Snooker's greatest characters, Willie Thorne. He was a professional before the game broke big on TV in the 80s, and then during Snooker's heyday, he became a household name. He probably didn't win as many tournaments as his talent deserved, but he's now taken his knowledge and great insight into the game into the commentary box, and Snooker's the richer for it. He's invented terms like the negative safety shot and the flat back pack. Every credit, Willie. This is the lovely Rita, you know, all the people who are act out as having an assistant. Why we've got men, I don't know. I don't know what's happening. It's always the lovely Rita, isn't it, every time with those, right? I'm going to have to cheat a little bit here. This is something I prepared earlier. Just amuse yourselves for a second, I'll be with you very shortly. <coughs> right, that looks about right. That looks about, I don't know why I'm trying this. Well, I, I should imagine that piece of paper it. is at the back of the Sorry pocket this, because camera, the balls are going to go up uh, the queues and he I'll doesn't want to see them disappear the over the pocket. But never mind. Where did the white ball go? Here we are. <clears throat> La -dee -dee. Actually, I do. I don't know whether you noticed that I do a bit of commentary on the TV. And of course, it's very, very difficult when it's going out live to the nation, like it is tonight. Because of course, if you say anything that has double meaning, you re immediately get people writing in or ringing in to say that you've said something wrong. Well, apart from mumbling a few times. I haven't said anything particularly wrong, but I'm sure you've all heard of Whispering Ted Lowe, have you? Yeah. You all heard of him? Has he ever guessed a shot right since you've been listening? <laughs> he, was <laughs> he was commentator on a game between Fred Davis and Eddie Chop. It was a long game. <laughs> now, Fred Davis at the time was 67 years of age. It's about seven years ago, and this is a true story. Fred was trying to reach over the table to play a shot. He couldn't reach it. So like we sometimes do, he tried to get his leg on the table to play the shot like this. He still couldn't reach it. So like we also sometimes do, Dennis Telly, you see many, many times playing it, decided to play the shot left-handed. To which Ted Lowe, going out live to the nation on grandstand on a Saturday afternoon, decided to come out with, well, there you are, ladies and gentlemen, at 67 years of age, Fred Davis is a little bit too old to get his leg over. <laughs> now... You can imagine he realised he was in trouble at this and tried to escape by saying he prefers to use his left hand instead. <laughs> well, <isn't it? laughs> As we're nearly running out of time, I need to do a couple of shots with the basket, so I'm going to have one attempt at this shot. We're going to try and pop these two reds. We're going to hit this red up the two cues around the top of the pocket, down the two cues, pop this one. The white will go off the cushion, go up these two cues around the top of the pocket and pop that one. I'll quickly do a handstand around the table while all this is going on. <laughs> Try and pop both reds. Here we go. 
Just attempting, just attempting, just stop that happening. Yes, lovely. If I get them all first time, you'd all get very bored, wouldn't you? <laughs> I'm just the stooge. I told you I can't play these shots. It looks lovely when it works. This one, it just never works. Right, here we go. Now, what this bread was supposed to do, you see, as you, now this is just happening in slow motion. It just goes down like that. And that one goes in there like that. And that one goes in there like that. And that was perfect, you know, no problem. Well, John Parrott's uh, been one of the all-time great players. I mean, anybody that's won the World and the UK Championship is obviously going to be a great player. And of course, he tried his hand at the trick shots. Unfortunately, John's not the best trick shot player in the world, but he played in it and did OK. But uh, John Parrott will be more remembered for being one of the best players and not one of the best trick shot players. John Parrott is a man of the people and I think that's one of his great appeals when it comes to these trick shot events. He loves interaction with the crowd, he's got a very ready wit and I think he really enjoys not just the competition but being out there in front of the crowd showing his skills. So there he is, he's a little boy, he's seven years of age and all he ever thinks about when he gets up in the morning is tractors. Nothing else in his life matters but tractors. He goes to all the fairs everywhere he can Absolutely loves it. Every minute of his life, he loves going to see these tractors. <clears throat> anyway, he's in there one day, and he sees this favourite tractor of his. Absolutely loves it. And he goes, goes up to sit in it, and he's sitting there playing with the controls and everything. And this horrible bloke comes up to him, and he says, what are you doing? Get out of there. He says, he said, oh, oh, please, he said, I, 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 you know, I've always loved this tractor. He said, can I? He said, no, no. He said, get out of there. And he wouldn't move. Anyway, before he can, anything happens, he gets a clip round the ear roll. And he starts crying. And, oh, I don't like tractors anymore, he said, and he gives up on them. Anyway, 20 years have passed, and he's walking down the street one day, and he looks up, and there's a burning building. Absolutely terrible. Smoke coming from everywhere. And he's standing there, and the fire brigade is struggling, and everything. He walks up to the, the fire chief, and he says, what's the matter? He said, we've got a mother and two children stuck in the top here. He said, we can't get them down. He said, it's just too much. He said, we just can't manage to do it. He says, I'll do it. He said, come on, he said, we're trained firemen. He said, we know what to do here. He said, no, I'll do it. What's this? In he goes, just like Superman, goes in there, straight up to the third floor, comes down with the mother. Fantastic, everyone's cheering. Unbelievable. The thought, it's getting thicker and thicker, the smoke. It's getting, oh, it's terrible. The fire, they can't get in, boss, he said. It's too much. They've got the masks on and everything. No problem to this fella. I'll do it, he says. Boof. Straight in again. Comes down with the first child. Well, they're absolutely over the moon. This is unbelievable. And then she said, you can't go back in. He said, it's too thick. He said, no, he said, I'll do it, I'll do it. He goes back in. Ten minutes later, he comes out covered in smoke. He's got the baby. The crowd are going wild. He said, that's unbelievable. And the fire chief comes up to him and he said, that is the most fantastic thing I've ever seen. He said, we've got the best equipment in the world. We've got the masks. We've got everything. How have you managed to do that? He said, it's easy. I'm an extractor fan. <laughs> <laughs> it's clean. Now, apparently, last year's trick shots, everybody had a go at this one, and it never worked. And we've had a go upstairs, and it hasn't worked either, so we might need a few goes. Black out of the centre of the three reds, cross the table, hit the triangle, jump over it, and into the pocket. And if you believe that, you'll believe anything. Terry Griffiths was due to play in the 2000 event but had to pull out at short notice. I knew how much he loved playing in the trick shots so I incorporated him into my routine. And I'm going to try and hit Terry Griffiths right in the mush <laughs> off five cushions. That's the type of person I am. <laughs> so, five cushions. One, two, three. Four, five, and straight up the main nostril, okay? <laughs> oh! <laughs> That's a bit hard, but I think we may have got him. Yes, right over in there! <laughs> Smashed his glasses and ruined his hairstyle. My most memorable trick shot. 
tournament was without question in Sun City, South Africa, when we performed the, the show uh, in a Roman amphitheatre with various nightlife flying around and landing on people and praying mantises just dropping on the table and it was hilarious. And the, if you remember the J. Arthur Rank gong at the end of each film, the end of each trick shot, there's this huge muscle man on the hill banging the gong when the time went out. It was so over the top, so outrageous, it summed up World Snooker Trick Shot. It was a fun event, but the competition was fierce. Terry Griffiths was one of the contenders. He had already won the first ever championship in 1993. Right then, what we can try and do is pot the black view in the centre pocket. What happens here, the white ball goes off one, two, three cushions, up the queues here, against the back of the pocket, back down the two queues, and pots the black in the middle pocket. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you can laugh, I gotta do the shot, you know? <coughs> right. Difficult to judge the angles, so I'll just have a few trial shots of this. But if I get it the first time it counts, okay? <laughs> there you go. It's quick enough. Be straight then. Hello. <laughs> we are there to make, uh, to try to make uh, happy the people watching us. So, and uh, I believe uh, most of time they are very happy to watch. Also, because uh, uh, most of time we try to do something new. Fabio. He, again with him, it didn't matter what the shots it was, it was his way of uh, not knowing very good English and he would just gesticulate round the place and uh, on your no, uh, Fabio from Italia. He is just hilarious and another one that, that really entertains. Excellent guy and love him to bits, good looking as well. I've only known uh, or seen Fabio Petroni um, uh, in the last couple of tournaments actually. I met him four years ago, I think it was up in Glen Rothers. Uh, again, uh, he brought a different dimension. Um, you know, the English players or the UK based players have a certain way to play trick shots, but this guy, uh, he brought a different dimension and uh, different trick shots altogether. It's very big this table here. Okay. Just like that. Okay. You know, <laughs> it's a long way. <laughs> okay. Okay, now I try to make the four ball. Now I think you will ask yourself why there is three color and one black. Three red and one black. Did you ask yourself? I don't know, just. <laughs> <laughs> okay, four ball. Black, red, red, and red. I tried to make more difficult with my leg. Elevate. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Woo! Thank you. In 2000, my routine featured the early shots. We were in Glenrothes in Scotland, and I wasn't too sure how much they knew about the history of the tournament. So I thought I'd tell them a pack of lies. Joe Davis was the first ever winner of the trick shot routine. And um, in, in the early days, obviously, the trick shots weren't anywhere near as, um, as, as complicated as today. And Joe Davis actually won the first trick shot championships with his first very tricky long black into the corner pocket, which at that time was very, very novel, because most of the time they were only playing shots from two or three feet before they missed them. But Joe Davis actually played this particular shot and won the 1945 World Trick Shot <laughs> Championships. <laughs> <laughs> After that, <coughs> you don't expect me to pot that, do you? After that, Fred Davis's brother came along 
and um, totally changed the face of the World Trick Shot Championships by introducing a new um, discipline into the, uh, the particular competition, and that was to try and fool the audience. From up until then, Joe was just playing shots, and people thought they were fantastic. But Fred was the first player to actually come along and try and tell the, the public that something else was going to happen, or that something that didn't, couldn't be believed was happening. So Fred actually introduced this amazing trick shot that was, uh, was the cutting edge in, in the 60s. I've lost you, haven't I? <laughs> um, so, so Fred put the balls in this position and proceeded to shock the crowd by actually saying that he was going to hit the black ball before hitting the two reds. There were gasps, as I hear you gasp now, <laughs> from the audience back in the 60s. They didn't have a lot of entertainment back in those days. It may have been the 50s. I can't remember. Who cares? And Fred casually walked up to the table and played probably the first trick shot every young child now learns, which is to hit the black ball before you hit the two reds with the white ball. And this is how Fred did it. Next up is Bogdan Wolkowski, a man regarded as one of the trick shot masters. We'll be seeing a lot more of him throughout our countdown, but he charts here first at number 34. Black ball and red ball in middle pocket. Two cushions and uh, one tri triangle, yes? Triangle. <laughs> Go, oh, hey. <laughs> now, very interested trick shot. Fabio tries one of his earlier shots again, this time making it a little more difficult. Okay. So, I will meet. Uh, I will uh, tell you that we. Uh, I've been in uh, in, the, in their home in Doncaster, and uh, and the wife say, Fabio, oh, my my husband doesn't work too much. He's so lazy, and he has a little belly, you know. So I I promised to her to keep him. I I say, hey, I call him in TV. He wants to come, maybe, you know. And I make a trick for him. Now I show you. Is uh, is here? Huh? Uh, is there? Oh, Steve. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Steve and Maria. They just married. Okay, Steve, you want to come, please? <laughs> Hi, Steve. Hi. Right. You just came here and and do press up, press up. Yeah. Time? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, a little. We practice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you come, 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 come. We practice this for uh, two, three days. So he's, he's getting better now. Don't touch my ball, huh? Th that ball, I mean, hey, hey. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so, how many you can do? Three. You can do ten, okay. You do ten. <laughs> ten is good. Okay, try, try, try. When you try it, do you tell me? Then I shut the football. One, two, eight. <laughs> Hey, better, you can do better. <laughs> okay. okay, we try. I'm, here, I'm here with this car, <laughs> you don't help me back. Okay, now. Wow! <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Massey, the Tennessee Tarzan. Uh, I would think of all the people I've uh, seen do trick shots, I, I think he's the most inventive. Mike a, is a real old-fashioned vaudeville entertainer, you know, he, he's a wonderful trick shot player, he's been playing shots and spin shots with his fingers all his life, he's a wonderful character, you know, he's a reformed gambler, reformed 
alcoholic, he found God, and he found trick shots. He also found a wife, a dog, and a guitar. I distinctly remember him not getting one shot to work, and he kept trying it and trying it, and in the end started singing a song. Uh, I've never actually resorted to that tactic. Maybe it could have worked. He would live off the audience, and he would always finish with a song which was a little bit worrying because his voice wasn't that great and yet it seemed somewhat in keeping with the event that Mike would sing some smoothie song to finish off with. Oh, I don't a burger queen With lips that taste like beer Got a prime filet waiting for me When I get away from here I swear to you Her lips are sweeter than the best strawberry wine So thank you, miss, but no thanks Cos I Apart from singing, he's also a very good trick shot player, probably one of the best in the world. He always used to develop new shots to make sure the judges were on his side. You try to bank the blank ball back in this pocket. It's a very difficult shot because the ball's going to mash. It's going to double kiss. But there is, there's two ways of making this shot. The first shot I'm going to do is the easiest way. I always carry a golf ball. And just exchange the cue ball with the golf ball, okay? And then, makes it a lot easier, okay? Yeah. What I think I like the best is uh, uh, listening to uh, Steve Davis doing this uh, uh, trick shot routine because it's so funny, uh, I can't stop laughing. Steve has got a lovely routine, uh, he's got a lovely way, he's got a lovely sense of humour. It might not be everybody's sense of humour, but, uh, and, and with the trick shots, there's nothing he can't do with a snooker cue. Well, Steve Davis is a bit like myself and Dennis, you know, he likes to get the audience involved, and obviously we've seen Steve many times on the trick shots, I don't think he's missed one of them. The thing is with Steve, he very rarely does a trick shot. You know, he seems to spend more time having a chat with the crowd and having laughing and giggling. I think one routine I saw him do a few years ago, I think he did two trick shots, both of which, you know, somebody with one arm could have played, but he had a, a laugh and a giggle, and I think he could finish second that year without playing a shot. It seems like he's done 20 shots. You analyse it, he's done three. And then he does that cheating one where he has three balls stuck together. Come on, Steve. Steve Davis, six times world and UK champion and a consummate professional when it comes to doing exhibitions. He's done them all around the country for many, many years, over a quarter of a century. One of the things he likes to do is involve a member of the audience, usually a young lad or a young lady, brings them down into the arena and he sets up a shot beforehand. Maybe sometimes these players have never even picked up a cue before and yet they pull the shot off every time. Now that's not because they're particularly skillful, it's because Steve is exceptionally skillful in putting that shot together and setting it up in such a way that they can't really miss. You need a volunteer. Um, yeah, you could get us a packet of crisps. <laughs> Cheese and onion. Cheese and onion and a, and a Coke. Thanks. Are serious? Serious! <laughs> you! Can you come out and help us with this trick shot? Come on, quick! Come on, come on! All right. <laughs> What's your name? Stephen. Stephen, see? <laughs> what do you reckon? <laughs> It's been a while since I visited uh, Paisley Stadium. <laughs> this is your life. <laughs> I saw you on the television in the monitor in our room. I thought, blimey, I've seen him before. And I realized, I've got loads of photos at home of me as a kid. <laughs> Stephen, would you like to do a trick shot that Alan Robidoux can't do? <laughs> It's a bit bitchy, I know, but yeah? Okay. You, you play a bit. Can you play a bit of snooker? No, no not at all. You can hit the ball. Well, well, let's see if you can hit the ball first. Just to. Just to um, obviously, I'm in stroke. I've played one shot. So you might as well just try and hit that white ball up and down the table. Get, get used to the table. Just give it a whack. Nice big whack. Steady, steady. It's nice to. <laughs> Have another go. Just get the feel of it. You know, relax. Enjoy yourself. Okay. No, oh, that wasn't so hard. I'd like a bit more power than that. Give it a nice big whack. That's good, okay. Right, so what Stephen's going to do, 
And I don't wish to highlight the fact that Alan didn't get this right. This is a tough shot. <laughs> no, no. No, it's a difficult shot. What we're going to do is just going to put a couple of balls to make the shot fractionally easier, because I can't have Stephen going away talking about me. That's Christian. <laughs> He's been sitting there. <clears throat> OK. What Stephen's going to do is um, to pot the black ball in the middle pocket. So it's the black ball in the middle pocket. Okay. Take it away. <laughs> hold on, hold on. <laughs> Bit of technical advice. Hit that red, full in the face, nice and firm. Give it your best shot. Okay. Mike Massey lands the number 30 spot as three balls okay. are shot into three this different shot. pockets. We're going to try to pocket the pink in the corner pocket, the blue in the side pocket, the green in the side pocket, the cue ball comes out through the gap, curves and goes and pockets the brown ball. So from there you should see the little arc. <laughs> in uh, less than a hundred shots. <laughs> okay, we got a half, we got part of it anyway, right? All right, so I'm gonna try it the same way one more time. This, if it doesn't go this time, <coughs> it's impossible. I don't know why I'm so nervous. I've, done, I've only done this about 10,000 times, you know. I guess it's good to be nervous, all right? They say you're more alert. Starting next is the disappearing shot. It was one of the compulsory shots in 1995 and a chance for a bit of one-upmanship on your opponents. I'm a bit nervous, sorry about that. <laughs> so where have they be putting this first ball then? <laughs> There's no need to know, it's all right. It's <laughs> I think it's about there. No, it's not, it's there. Fabio Petroni is the Italian that cried in the Moscone Cup, and he'll always be known for that. But he's also a crazy trick shot performer. You know, he'll dress up like a woman. He'll put lipstick on, he kisses men in the audience. I mean, he's a really strange guy, but actually very entertaining. He's got this Latin temperament, and uh, I think people like to see that. I think people like to see people who uh, who give their all and it looks like it matters, you know. Fabio, yeah, he, he did a trick show once which involved this great big Scottish transvestite with a beard. 
I'm not quite sure what he was getting at, but and the ball disappeared up his kilt or skirt or something like that. It was fairly unsavoury. That was very funny. I meet this guy and I say, hey, come on, help me to do this trick shot. And I think you, you saw, you will see in TV. Then uh, the ball goes around inside the legs and after make it uh, the ball. Because that is funny, you know, I, I'm like that. I thought uh, to do that trick shot for three, four years. And I did once in, uh, in Russia for exhibition and uh, they love it. Just it's funny, just funny. Okay, may I ask, hey, hey, what is it? I need one beautiful girl, one beautiful girl. <laughs> One beautiful girl, one, hey, many beautiful girls. But I want one special. Oh, <laughs> must be like my ex-girlfriend. Woo! Oh, 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 oh. Uh, you wanna, you want, hey, how are you? Hey, what's your name? Margaret. Margaret? Oh, how oh, can you? Oh, Margaret! Oh, can you? Oh, Margaret! Oh. Wow, Margaret. You want to say hi to anyone? Oh, okay. sorry. Oh, Margaret, I mean, you can just uh, come here and just uh, watch if I can you help him. Help him, just, uh, you, you understand what I'm saying? Oh, your can, I, can I touch you a little? OK. You can, can you come here, please, come. Just uh, uh, try to sit. Uh, oh. Hey, hey, don't watch me. Just, excuse me, sir. It's okay. <laughs> Do you like this? Oh, just. Hey, did you? Uh, oh, it's okay. <laughs> nobody, nobody will uh, trust you. Then you are. <laughs> How they can trust? Then you are women. How? Okay. You know, this is the last shot. Wow, this is the real shot. You know, I'm sorry, but I have to tell you something. I cannot sleep if I don't make a nine ball. Wow, I'm sorry. I love your game, but also mine. So what I'm trying to do, to make the nine ball in the side. Can you believe it? Say no. So I do. <laughs> You're wrong. <laughs> okay. Can you believe it? Okay, no, yes, I do. <laughs> I try, huh? Nine ball in the middle. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Fabio Petrini, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, look the arm up. We've only seen a select few of the trick shot highlights so far. Next is a legend of the snooker world, Cliff Thorburn. Now, when you saw Cliff at the competitive table, he came across as dour and methodical. But off the table, he's one of the funniest people I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. In the atmosphere of a trick shot competition, where the emphasis was correctly on entertainment, well, then Cliff was a master. You know, I gambled a few times, and, uh, you know, you end up in some uh, pretty strange situations. But one time, I was playing a fellow for money and he'd had a couple of drinks, you know, he went to, uh, well, I mean, obviously, you know, was very upset about the fact that I had this black for the game ball. And then he comes up to me and says, hey, you're not so good. So it's now make it, you know. So I said, okay. No, I, I wasn't. So we have to pocket the uh, black ball in the side pocket. Now, invariably, when you're playing somebody in a club and he's had a couple of drinks, he's normally got a backer, isn't he? And then his backer says, oh, that's fine and dandy. But let's see you do it now. I was hustling the guy. <laughs> then they doubled the bet. Why? <laughs> I've never conned anybody in my life, and I hope to God I never have to do it again. Come on now, please. OK.
I have known Terry Griffiths when we were amateurs. Uh, before we turned professional, we turned professional at roughly the same time. Uh, and Terry, like us, all, all of us, has always had a trick shot routine. Uh, I think Terry really uh, doesn't really try and invent shots, the shots he's been doing in a while, but he's got that lovely Welsh sense of humour and that lovely Welsh accent that has always made him very appealing. And he's, he, he, I don't think he does it too much anymore, but he was always very popular with the public. Griffiths I remember because he used to stop keep doing his hair. You know, Griffiths would sing a song because he's Welsh and then he'd stop and comb his hair. That's what he was more famous for than these trick shots. But he, had a, he was a lovely curious, and, you know, and Terry had this lovely laid back way about him. Once we put him on a time clock, it was all over for Terry. Well, Terry was a, a great trick shot player. He was very affable with the crowds and things. I remember coming up when I first turned professional and I did a few exhibitions with him uh, out uh, in the clubs and things like that. And that's where we really we learnt our trade and uh, before the big money came into snooker. And, um, and of course, that's, uh, that's where it all came about. And the natural progression was to do the trick shot championship, which was fantastic when it came around. Well, Terry Griffiths, 1979 world champion. He was involved in the very beginning with the matchroom trick shots. And he did silly things like using props like the 10p piece, where he rolled it down the cushion trying to pot a ball. He was really old school, and uh, he didn't really do any of the more advanced trick shots. One of my favorite little shots, we using the 10p coin. An old 10p coin. <laughs> it's a bit awkward when you go into the gentleman's toilet now, isn't it? You've got a... <laughs> you haven't got any new 10p's in it. It's a bit dodgy. Right, then the 10p's placed in the side cushion here. <coughs> Excuse me. What I'm going to try and do is knock the 10p, swerve it around the middle pocket, comes down the table there, and knocks the pink into the corner pocket. I haven't played it yet. You can laugh when I miss it now. There you go. We all know Dennis Taylor, very good at the trick shots. And uh, Irish sense of humour, uh, yeah, t terrific. Very popular with the audience, and, and the big glasses swing it, don't they? You know, people look at him and go, how can you wear a pair of glasses like that? Dennis is just amazing. Um, the audience, you know, always knew that they had this, um, this air waiting for him to come out because they were going to be entertained, and that's what it was about. You know, trick shots are about entertaining the audience. Uh, they don't care how hard or difficult they are, they just want to be entertained, and he just had them in stitches from the minute he walked out to the minute he left. Well, of course, Dennis Taylor, one of the crowd favourites, and when he went out there, he always used to try and take the mickey out of other players, but what he did do was always take the mickey out of himself. And I remember one time he came out with the biggest pair of glasses on, but obviously false ones because he had windscreen wipers on. So what he always did was entertain the crowd. What about the Dutchman? <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to go fishing, and it was very, very cold, 15 degrees below. So he still wanted to go fishing. So he brought some whiskey with him and his fishing rod, and when he got there, it was so cold. He had to cut a hole in the ice. So he's got the fishing rod in the ice, he's fishing away, and a voice said, there are no fish in there. So he looked round and there was nobody there, so he had a swig of the whiskey, fishing again, a voice again said, there are no fish in there. So he looked round and he said, is that you, God? And the voice said, no, this is the ice rink manager. <laughs> it was a skating rink. No. This time, snookered behind the 15 reds and the triangle. Got to get the white over the 15 reds, down the table, through the triangle, on down the table, pot the black. And if this one doesn't work, I'd watch the camera. <laughs> <laughs> this shot could cost me 30,000 pounds. <laughs> You never know 
you, the shots you're gonna try is gonna work. So if it's not working all the time, then the audience is gonna, well, who is this guy? Why is there? <laughs> Vincent Fake I met in, uh, in Preston. Uh, um, he's the reigning world trick shot champion, and uh, it was fantastic. You know, he, he couldn't speak a lot, a lot of English. We had to sort of listen closely to what he was doing, but his trick shots were, were great. And again, his rapport with the crowd was, was very, very good. When you think about snooker, you don't necessarily think about France, but there's a gentleman from across the channel by the name of Vincent Fake who's excellent when it comes to snooker trick shots. Now, one of his great trademarks is the snake shot. Now, this particular shot has got plenty of venom and quite a bite. Bang, 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 it's over. It's tremendous. Bonsoir. Comment ça va? Ça va bien? Oui? Très bien. <laughs> Donc, je vais commencer par un coup très difficile. C'est un coup où je dois rentrer une seule bille. Oh, so, did I spoke French? Yeah? Oh, sorry. Don't worry, subtitles, don't worry. Okay, I will speak in, ling in English because I think not everybody will understand French. So, what I'm going to do is using uh, the 15 reds to put only one ball, the black ball. Let's see. Seems a bit extravagant, really. <laughs> uh, this combination happens all the time. What do you think, Steve? That's, that's like one of my frames, that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, somebody touched my ball. Remember that safety shot I played, Steve, and you all finished <laughs> there? <laughs> like this. It's like an, a nice S. I need the black ball. Do you think it will go? Okay, I will explain right now. What will happen? Okay, with the white ball I will carom the, the, the first red, will carom the other one, the other one, the other one, the other one and make the, the black ball. And hopefully, I will have enough power. <laughs> Yo. I uh, was brought up in the days where there was probably two or three snooker tournaments a year. Uh, so basically, your bread and butter was doing exhibitions, and, and mainly in the summer, exhibitions were done at the holiday camps. Uh, the tables weren't very good, so you couldn't really display how good you were by playing snooker, so you had to develop a trick shot routine. It was a bit like a vaudeville act. Well, Virgo, of course, was an impersonator more than a trick shot. You know, he would take off the players. He did a wonderful Alex Higgins impersonation, which would have everyone in hysterics. Uh, you know, he's a very funny guy. Again, a lot of these players have got a comedian lurking behind them, and Virgo was very much a sort of the, the straight, stand-up, dry, funny man. I mean, we all know John for uh, um, for his takeoffs is, uh, of certain players. We've seen that at the Crucible Theatre, and uh, John again is a great exhibition player, and, uh, and his trick shots are fantastic. Well, John Virgo is another great pal of mine and a great trick shot artist, and of course he became very famous with a television show, but he developed new shots all the time. He was always bringing little things like tumblers and that, and always trying to entertain the crowd at all times. Put the black on this tall tube, like so. Put the white against the cushion, and put the pink on the cushion, if it'll stay there. There you go. And the idea is to spot the pink and black. And the way it works, I hit the pink very hard. It runs down the table. As it goes in the pocket, it will knock the tube from under the black. The black will stay there. And because I've hit the white on the top, the white will then run down and knock the black in. Here we go. Spot the pink and black. 
Yeah. John Virgo pleases the audience again there. Next, Mike Massey charting once more at number 22. You know, everyone's been doing some jump shots, so I thought that I would try a little jump shot and maybe a little, little bit different. We're going to take the, uh, the black ball. Let's place the black ball up here in the corner somewhere. I'm used to saying eight ball. You know, the eight ball is black in America. And we're going to take a few balls and place them uh, right in there. That should be enough. Eight balls. Now, I like pressure. You know, as the players have been talking about pressure. I like pressure. So we're going to take some water and pour in the glass in the cup. Now, we're going to take the cup. Who follows me anyway? Yeah, the Polish player. He's got some great shots. Maybe if I miss this shot, he might have some trouble, you know. Okay, now, where's the cue ball? Here it is. What I'm going to try to do here is jump over the eight balls, the cup of water, and pocket the black. That's a pretty high jump. It's awful quiet in here. You all make a little noise here. You know, it's, when it gets quiet, everybody gets nervous, you know. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay, now. Thank you, thank you. I met Elaine uh, about 15 years or so ago when he came on to the circuit, possibly a bit longer. And, um, I remember when we used to mess around uh, doing the circuit on the tournaments and things and, and he used to do this finger spin situation where he used to take the black out of the pack and he'd, he'd have bets with people how many shots he's going to take and it was marvellous to watch. I mean he also did all the other trick shots but he again, uh, a Canadian lad came over, a uh, different slant on it and he, he was fantastic at the trick shots. He was good, he's one of these guys who's really professional, um, obviously his English wasn't his first language but he was still pretty good with the crowd. Um, yeah, just kind of well-rehearsed, well well-practiced tricks that tended to work for him. Well, when Alan Robidoux was on the circuit, we were very good friends. We used to talk about the Montreal Expos baseball team uh, all the time. He was a big fan of them, and I love baseball as well. So I've got a vested interest in Alain. The great thing about him was those finger spins he used to do. No one else could quite pull them off like, like the French-Canadian. And uh, when he went out uh, into an arena to do his trick shots, like John Parrott, like Steve Davis, like all of the great entertainers in snooker, he seemed to warm to the crowd's involvement. And uh, the more they got involved, the more he seemed to enjoy himself and the more he seemed to excel. Okay, what I'll try to do here, I'm gonna try to uh, play a force follow on the white, hit the, hit the red, the white's gonna go in, in the tunnel here and hit all the reds and try to put the black in the corner. Always easy shots, eh? Okay. Okay, I've got time, I'm alright. Black in the corner. The next shot, which has reached number 20 in our countdown, is one I did in 2001. Now, when you're as boring as I am, you're paranoid about the crowd walking out or possibly falling asleep. So over the years, I've learned not to have too many silences during my routines. Constant verbal drivel is the mainstay of my shows, that and never returning to the same venue. And anyway, sometimes it isn't about the outcome of the shot, it's in the delivery and being honest with the audience. My trick shot's no different to Dennis's, John's and Ray. None of them are going to work, also. <laughs> going to start off with a pretty easy shot and work up to some harder ones later. And as you can see, with this first shot, once I get two more balls on the table, as you can see, it's pretty obvious what's gonna happen. <laughs> That's right, you all guessed it in the front row. I'm gonna pop the one that looks a completely different color from the other ones into a pocket. But which pocket? The black ball is going to go into this pocket here. OK, what I'm going to do is to strike the white ball onto that two-ball plant there. The second red 
comes off the side cushion, hits the four ball plant, and that sends the black along the cushion to about there. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> while that's happening, the white ball comes off this first red, cannons that one out of the way, <laughs> and the black then goes along the top cushion, in off that red, into the pocket. A nice easy one to start with, okay? <laughs> These three reds here and these three reds here have absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the shot. They are there just to try and confuse you and to make the shot look a lot better than it actually is. Just thought I'd get that straight. OK. So, black ball in the corner pocket. Here we go. Whoa, great. Number 19 is Fabio Petroni playing a masse shot via a cushion. The red ball in the corner. Hmm. Cliff Thorburn is back charting at number 18 with a difficult shot which he calls the Evil Knievel shot. Yeah, thanks. Okay. I'm going to try and pocket the uh, pink ball. The one appears to be a seemingly hopeless position up into the corner pocket up there. Yeah, thanks. Miss one shot, eh? My God. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> okay. Pink ball in the corner pocket. Bogdan, arguably the greatest of all the trick shot players. You know, this was a full-time job for Bogdan. You know, he would go home, he would work on his trick shots 52 weeks a year. He was not a snooker player or a pool player. He was a trick shot specialist, and it shows in his shots. The most spectacular shots, the most creative shots, came from Bogdan. No question. Once he asked us if if he could use something like 50 triangles on a trick shot, and could we get them for him? Obviously, well, we couldn't. And, but he'd always turn up with a suitcase full of these bizarre things that he'd made. Oh, he gets all these extra bits of stuff. Imagine him arriving, you, you know, at customs. Anything to declare, yeah. 16 triangles, you know. 17 bottles, uh, big balls, all with little chips and holes. In. No, I think uh, he's taking that a step further, which is good. Well, another one of Bogdan Wilkos's great shots was the roller coaster shot where he used cues balanced on juice cartons. Of course, the idea was to send it up the cues over the top down and pop one in the corner pocket. And uh, he developed that shot and he was more relieved than most when that one worked. Named uh, shot the roller coaster. Green, green ball. I don't know where it is, white ball. Okay. Oh, thank you. And now, white ball, pocketing red ball into this corner pocket, and spinning back up the roller caster, and pocketing uh, green ball.
Ten Wojtek był dobry. Niech! O! The next snooker player to be added to the countdown is Alain Robidoux, probably the second most successful snooker player to emerge from Canada, but very possibly the most talented. Alain is a great personality and was sadly missed when he retired from the professional circuit and returned to his homeland. Alain won the event in 1996, and this is one of the shots that helped him secure the title. First shot is going to be the triangle shot. On that shot, I'm going to impersonate a player who's been, who's been on the, earlier. It's uh, my friend Cliff Thorburn. Uh, have you heard of him? <laughs> OK. OK. Uh, Cliff is the, the grinder from Canada. And me, uh, I'm the grinder from, from Quebec. So I speak French. My first language is, uh, is French. And my second one, I haven't found it yet. So, uh, OK, so Cliff Thorburn doing this shot. OK, the shot I'm going to do, I'm going to try to put the red in the corner. Tough shot, you know, red in the corner. And stop the white dead so the triangle can stay up on the three, on the three remaining balls. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Easy shot, OK? So Cliff Thorburn. You've seen him before, eh? Remember? I'm still doing him, OK? <laughs> OK. I don't know. I'm going to do it because I don't know how to do it. So, OK, stop that with the wipe. It's not over yet. <laughs> OK, now I'm going to try to put the red back where it was before. You know, it's, uh, it's a situation that happens very often in a match. <laughs> so red at the same place. Same shot, but on the other side, like you can see. OK. I've known Cliff Thorburn uh, since he first came over from Canada. A uh, great character. Anyone who's ever been in the company of Cliff Thorburn will tell you what a lovely, dry sense of humour he's got. Well, Cliff Thorburn developed the chopstick shot, and what that was, he used to hold two cues in his hand, using like chopsticks as you would do to have Chinese food, and collect all the balls on the thing. He used to get 15 cues, and I remember sometimes he used to get the audience involved when it'd be tend to trip as if all the cues were going to fall over the floor. But the idea, of course, would have all 14 balls or 15 balls on the queue and roll them all off and try and pop the black in the corner pocket. And 20 times out of 20, Cliff Thorburn got it right. When I was in Hong Kong a while ago, right, okay, I got to see how the Chinese played uh, snooker, same rules as us. They have to pot a red, then a color, but they have to use the chopsticks, okay? So this is a typical <laughs> Sunday night, all right, downtown Hong Kong. That's the chopsticks. Leo Ma. <laughs> Red Ball's high pocket. <laughs> Bank in the side. Never missed a shot as a professional in my life. 
We go straight from 15 to 14. Here's John Virgo. Oh, this is a quick one. Uh, <laughs> this was invented by a Japanese lady pool player called Kiramoshi, actually. And it's called the Japanese gate. And basically what we see, we put the cue near the cushion, two reds in between the cue and the cushion, and the idea is to pot the pink without moving the reds, okay? It's supposed to work something like this. There you go, you see? <laughs> the Japanese gate! Oh, it's all over there. Most of these players had a great rapport with the audience and each one of their personality came across differently you know some would camp it up some would be you know quite vulgar humor some would be very dry humor and what you saw was the personality of the player coming out through the medium of trick shot entertainment always like to uh, have the crowd around because when you uh, have the ambience and you can you feel like they um, help you to, to to do your shots and they give you uh, some positive um, um, I don't know the name, but uh, you get more power and to, to do your shots. When it comes down to it, with a lot of trick shots, it's, it's not the striking of the cue ball, it's how you set the balls up. So you can spend five minutes setting balls up, and then quite often the ones that look, look good is when you get a kid out of the audience and you basically say to them, right, hit that cue ball there reasonably hard, and they don't know what they're doing, they hit it, and 57 balls fly into pockets all over the table. Those ones are always quite good. Mike Massey's famous card trick for me is the greatest one of all of the snooker trick shots because it doesn't just encompass snooker skill, it also involves magic. How he does it, I don't know. If I was a member of the magic circle, I wouldn't break the code, purely and simply because I haven't got a clue how he pulls it off. We're going to take the glass and uh, place the pink ball on the blue spot. Okay, I need a volunteer. I need a volunteer for this shot here. I'll tell you, yeah, right here. Would you come out here, please? Yeah, come on out here. <laughs> What's your name? Andrew. Pardon? Andrew. Andrew. Andrew, you know, so I volunteered you. I used to be in the Army, and when they said they needed a volunteer, they'd say, you. Okay, so I got you, okay? <laughs> We're going to do a little card trick. Do you play cards? No? Okay. After this card trick, you'll probably never play a card game in your life, okay? We're going to take a deck of cards. Here they are, okay? Normal deck, bicycle cards, okay? Now, we're going to take the cards, and what I would like for you to do, let's take this card and put it up here, is just, just choose a card there. One card, yeah. Okay, I'm going to turn my back. And show it to the audience, okay? Show it to the audience. I wish I had a mirror. Yeah. <laughs> okay, y'all see the card, right? Okay, don't, I'm going to turn back around, so don't let me see the card. Okay, here I come. Okay, now place the card on top. Now we're going to take the card, cut the cards so your card is in the middle of the deck, right? Your card's in the middle, okay? Now we're going to take... A Scottish coin. That is, is that a Scottish coin? I've been, you know, I was in Barcelona a couple of weeks. I don't know. Okay, now we're going to take the cards, place the cards in the glass with the help of this coin and the balls. We're going to try to find your card and pocket the two balls at the same time. Okay, here we go. Now, you won't be able to see it, but you all will be able to see his card. Okay, here we go. Concentrate. Okay, there I go. See it? Hey, get on up there now. Okay. It's always been easy to hit a ball into a basket. I mean, if you hit a ball, if you really hit it hard, you could probably have the ball in the D, the white ball and the basket in the middle of the table and you could jump it into the basket. When we were doing that last one in Preston, uh, I thought, I, w I wonder how far I can hit a golf ball. So I put the basket at one end of the table and I put the golf ball at this end. 
And I said, I'm now going to hit the golf ball, only because I'd done it in rehearsal, you know, and I thought, uh, when I've been practicing, I, I could hit the golf ball full length of the table. Obviously, you've got to be very accurate because, well, it's only that wide, the, the opening. And I did it first time. One of my greatest achievements. But the worst thing about my golf is my chipping. You'll vouch for that cliff, aren't you? So what I'm going to do, full length of the table, I'm going to chip this golf ball into the basket. OK, I know, you know the way I chip. You know. So here we go. Golf ball into the basket. Four. <laughs> now, we're only allowed three, but I know, I know I get your drift. Here we go. Wow. Yes! <laughs> Thank you, Wagner. Wow. So I'm not a bad chipper after all. Props are an important part of a trick shot routine. The amount of props a player uses is directly proportionate to how big the boot of his car is. Fortunately, Bogdan Volkowski from Poland has a very large car. Here he is, charting again using some paper bags. This is number 11. Six. What's his name? Buck. Six bucks. One ball, corner pocket, and now pocketing green ball. We're about to see the top 10 greatest world snooker trick shots. And so far, there have been some great clips, including Bogdan Wolkowski's roller coaster, John Virgo's Japanese gate shot, and Cliff Thorburn doing the chopsticks. So which trick will be crowned number one? Well, there's always been a great rivalry between the players on and off the screen, and it's no different here. As soon as a player messed up a trick shot, you could be sure someone like Terry Griffiths would be going straight out after us, attempting the same shot for one-upmanship rights. So let's count down the remaining 10 greatest snooker trick shots. Charting at number 10 is Mike Hallett. My first introduction to trick shots was uh, in 1995 when I was invited by Barry Hearn uh, to Sun City, South Africa. And uh, it was a fabulous uh, um, tour. We were there for about six days and I really, really enjoyed it. Mike Hallett's one of these uh, bullet a gate type of people and I think he proved that when we did the last one at Preston, you know. Uh, the problem is that if a trick shot doesn't work, then you, you know, you, you just sort of give the uh, impression anyway that that's amazing. That's the first time it's never worked. Mike was, uh, you know, probably an old, older breed of UK snooker player who, who from the from the old days, had a, a, a repertoire of trick shots that they used because they do club nights and that quite a lot. Um, yeah, Mike was pretty solid. I don't think he ever won it or got on the uh, winner's rostrum, but I think he, he, he did his best. I do two or three different shots with the basket, and this is one of them. Rapid fire shot is uh, the guy holds the basket, the lad holds the basket. I've got six reds, and I, I, I rapidly knock those reds into the uh, into the basket, and I ask him to hold the basket tightly. And of course, when I miss, it's his fault. But it's not mine. He's moving the basket or whatever. But we had some fun. I think it took me a couple of takes, two or three takes, to get it right. But um, but uh, it, it was great fun. The young lad enjoyed it. What's your first name? Sean. Sean. Sorry, Sean. Yeah, I'm sorry. Is that your father? Is that your dad? Would you like to stand up, sir, please? Could you stand up? He's a big one, Steve. No. <laughs> <laughs> where's, uh, where's the head of security, just in case? And then. <laughs> what I'd like to do, Sean, right, okay, if you're just testing there, if you just see there's not much uh, room to get a ball in there, okay, would you uh, 
I'd like to just pop it around to the audience. So somebody just have a quick <laughs> look, you know, just um, just show them you can. I can actually get a red in there. All right. Not too long. We've got a 45-minute show, you know. <laughs> Right, come on, just milk it a bit more, go on. <laughs> How many laps are you going to do? <laughs> what I want you to do, there's nothing in there, no tricks or anything, okay? All right, say yes, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, sure, what I want you to do, I've got six reds here, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to try and pop all six reds into the basket, but I need to hold that basket very tight against the cushion, okay? <sighs> do you get points for doing the trick shot right or not doing them right? Injuries. <laughs> Injuries. <laughs> right, we're going to try and pop all six reds into the basket, ladies and gentlemen. This is called the rapid fire shot. Okay, hold it very tight. Oh. Oh. Dennis was always very funny, you know, Dennis loves to be the entertainer and he's a very funny guy and you know, and he learned these trick shots the hard way, going up and down clubs, you know, working men's clubs for years, earning a living and establishing a rapport with the audience. Dennis is obviously most famous I think for his machine gun shot and, and also for winning the world championships in the greatest ever final ever seen. Uh, those two things will keep Dennis working for the rest of his life. A machine gun shot is the hardest shot. Uh, any, any player will tell you that. Uh, you can do all your spinning as Mike Massey, in, but the machine gun shot uh, is the hardest one of the lot because it's, uh, it, there's an awful lot of skill uh, in playing a machine gun shot. And, you know, I would say that that is the hardest one to play. Dennis Taylor was one of the very best at the machine gun shot and a lot of players used to watch Dennis because he, he always get at least seven or eight balls. One year he decided to do it slightly different with golf balls, so it was an absolutely first time one. And as usual, he got it right. Now anything can happen with this shot here. As I say, the machine gun shot was made famous many, many years ago by the late, great Joe Davis. I don't think this has ever been attempted anywhere in the world. I don't think it has anyway. I'm gonna try and do the machine gun shot with the golf balls here. So the idea is to shoot the white into the corner pocket. Before it gets there, we'll try and get all the golf balls in. Steve Davis, who was on earlier, there's only a few players play the machine gun shot. Steve Davis can do it with 15 reds. He doesn't use a white, though. <laughs> <laughs> He's a lot of fun these days, isn't he, Steve, eh? <laughs> Remember, he used to be a right boring sod back in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't he? <laughs> I remember when he used to take a Valium as a stimulant. <laughs> <laughs> Barry Hearn, who's still managing, used to say to me, he says, don't you worry about Steve Davis. He said, he's got a great head for money. He said, he's got a slot in it right on the... <laughs> Oh dear. How long have I got left here? Two minutes. Two minutes. Time to tell you one final wee story because Andrew helped me out there. I hope I get this right. Reminds me of a lovely wee story. Scotsman and Englishman, Irishman, Welshman, drinking at the bar, waiting on their wives. They're on holiday. So they're having a few drinks and they start talking about the family. How many family have you got? The wee Scotsman says, he says, I've got an 11 year old son. He says, and he called him Andrew because he was born in St. Andrew's Day. Said, That's very good. So the wee English fella, he says, uh, do you know, that's a coincidence. He said, I've got an 11-year-old son, and we called him George because he was born in St. George's Day. So the Welshman says, well, you're not going to believe this, but what a coincidence. I've got an 11-year-old son as well, and we called him David because he was born in St. David's Day. And the wee Irish fella says, well, you're not going to believe this, he says. <laughs> but what a coincidence, he says. Do you know, the same thing happened to our pancake. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I hope I can get this first time. It's the very first time that I've tried this in public. So the machine gun shot with golf balls. Here we go.
Mike Massey, he always um, always is regarded, I suppose, as, as the master through the, the way that he set his shots up because he would use like all the balls on the table and take a long time setting up what looked like a tremendously complicated shot. But what it actually was, it was more the way of the setting up rather than the difficulty. It wasn't a, a skill shot, it wasn't necessarily a hard shot. The balls were gonna go as long as it was set up right. But then you think, okay, that's his, that's his talent, that's what he's good at. Then all of a sudden he'd start this, this finger flicking one where he's throwing the ball up with his fingers and putting a spin on it and it would come around and come back down and, and pop the ball over the corner. And then he'd reduce the, the space so, sorry, lengthen the space so it got harder and harder and it, you had to take your hat off to him that the guy is, you know, he's a, he's a master. I'm going to go around the black and pocket the red and then I want you to pull the ball on back like, like doing the Lambo, okay? Yeah. Okay, just catch it when it does go. i got to get... Oh, there we go. Okay, catch it. Whoops! Okay, now going back, going back. Gets a little more difficult, chalk up. I didn't bring my favorite caddy, you know. <laughs> Whoa. There it is. Mm, get on over there. Okay, going back, going back. On the black spot. On the black. I never went back <laughs> this far before. I was One. Two. Okay, One of the oldest shots, of course, is to get someone from the audience and, and lay them on the table with a piece of chalk in their mouth, you know, a black ball, and to obviously to get rid of <laughs> it. never misses and it never stops entertaining people. It involves the audience, which is good. There are 20 funny lines to use while you're sticking uh, a piece of chalk in a young lady's mouth or you're getting her to lay on the table and making sure that her underwear is not showing. You know, there's a thousand, it, it's, it's almost vaudeville, that shot. And of course, it's a shot that you and I could play. It's quite, an, quite an easy shot to play. I tried it once and I hit the person on the nose. <laughs> I wasn't too, uh, you know, there was a sort of bang. Fortunately, there was only a bit of blood came out. It was a holiday camp once. Uh, so it's not a shot I like. I, f I find it a bit, uh, threatening really that, that you're having to hit this ball out of someone's mouth. Well Dennis Taylor was one of the very first players to develop a shot where you would actually shoot a ball out of somebody's mouth. He always used to get a pretty girl out of the audience and the idea was the girl has to lie on the table, hold a piece of chalk in her mouth with a ball on top of it, usually the black ball. Dennis would be down the other end and of course while he's got the girl lying there with a the ball he'd start cracking jokes, the ball would fall out the girl's mouth and he really loved to get the audience involved but eventually of course with the ball in the lady's mouth he would shoot the white, hit the ball and the ball would go into the corner pocket shot that really got the crowd going. If you come round this side, just sit on the table, swing your legs over there, <laughs> lie down with your head there looking up at the ceiling. That's, yeah, a little bit closer this way and it, over there slightly. If you just lie down, that's perfect. What, what happens here, we put all the lights out. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I've got the white on a block of chalk here. If you could just bite that. Look straight up and bite the chalk. And chin up a little bit. There we go, chin up. Whoop. That's perfect, yeah. Now the black is in a fairly tricky position as well. Now I've got to pot the black out of, uh, sorry, what was your first name again? <laughs> <laughs> up a little bit. Got to pot the black in the top pocket, but you'll have to be quiet, ladies and gentlemen. The last time I tried it, the young lady swallowed the black. <laughs> Should have seen the shot I played to get the black out. I was, uh, that was good. Here we go. Black in the top pocket. Oh, first time. Thank you. Give it, give it. Thank you. Mm. That's fine. Ladies and gentlemen, Dennis Taylor. We continue to see some unusual props in our trick shot countdown. 
In this next trick, Vincent Thacke gets a call from France, which helps him pocket the balls. This is number six. The nine ball. Okay. This is my mobile phone. <coughs> okay. So here I have to pocket two balls <coughs> in one shot. So the white ball and the nine ball. So this is very difficult. Okay, so back from here to France. Normally the phone is ringing and I pocket the two balls. <laughs> like this. Fabio Petroni makes it into the top five with some fancy footwork. In, uh, in uh, the red, but I, I must change my shoes. All right? This morning I practiced in Doncaster Field. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. What I'm going to try to make uh, the uh, shot the cue ball. It will be back and must uh, come uh, outside of the table. I will uh, make some, uh, you understand, and uh, make the, the green one here. For the first time in my life, maybe I do it. Well, we're nearing the end and we'll soon find out which trick shot is number one. But with four left to go, there are going to be more props, more surprised audience members and more unusual stunts. At number four is Bogdan Volkowski and his 3Q pyramid. Look. Two cues. Black ball. Oh. and make pyramid. Wow. <laughs> now free cushion and uh, closed triangle. <laughs> Maybe.
black ball, corner pocket. Props and trick shots go hand in hand, and as the game gets more complicated and perhaps more creative, more and more props are used. We started off with playing cards, uh, we ended up with bottles of beer and mobile phones. You've got to watch the shots to understand that, that there is whatever helps to make it more entertaining, people will use. But originally it was just cues, you know, and you'd put cues on the table and play shots around the cues, or you'd Thorburn would do his Chinese chopstick shots with the cues. But then, of course, along came the masses and the bog dance and the fouquets, and they got creative. I mean, suddenly you are seeing balls of fire and balls going through them, it's like a circus. But that's, that's nice, that's entertaining, because the players have actually gone away and thought about how they can make their routine more demanding, more creative, and above all, much more entertaining. Okay. This is a shot you'll probably never get in a game of eight ball. Uh, what we're going to try to do is play, shoot into the 13 ball, have the cue ball jump up, hit the three ball, and have the eight ball fall down and stay on top of the bottle in less than 100 shots. <laughs> First shot. There you go. Vincent Fate misses out on the top spot, but name? secures number two with a magic trick. Lira, and you? Anissa. Lira and Anissa. You have to choose one of the colors. You can you can choose one of the color. Tell us which one you choose. The pink. The pink. Okay, the pink. Can you help me to put the, the cows everywhere on the table? Yeah. Put it, put. Yeah. Everywhere. The snooker is so big. Okay. So you're going to play the pink ball is going to stop uh, close to a card or on the card and I already uh, turn a, a card upside down in this deck and hopefully it's going to be the same card. Okay, you can play. Carefully, if you miss, I miss a shot. <laughs> no, you have to play a little harder, okay? I said carefully. Sorry for that. Okay, harder. Yes. We are lucky. So, this is the card normally we'll uh, find here, okay? Okay, you want to take the card? You can watch. Two of hearts. Can you turn this card? Because if I turn it, you're going to say I'm doing a, a trick. It's a two of hearts. You liked it? Yeah, you like it? So you think there is two of hearts everywhere on the table? Yeah? Okay, we're gonna turn the, t the cards now to see if there is more than one two of hearts. I suppose, you know, as the game developed and, and, and the real specialists came in, you know, you'd have to look at Bogdan, 
who has created some more, more spectacular shots than anyone. I mean, particularly the shot with the youngster standing on top of the triangle while Bogdan's blindfolded. I mean, it was been difficult to miss the shot because he knew the angles, but it was more than just a shot. It was the, the creation of a moment. Obviously, we all remember Bogdan with the lads standing on all the, uh, the triangles. Uh, I never really see what, the, what, what that shot's about, apart from the fact you can balance so many triangles and get someone to stand on them. Uh, so maybe it's the quality of triangle that, uh, that, that we should be appreciating. Uh, and then he just knocks one ball into a pocket and then it's replaced by another ball. Although, don't try it at home, as probably is the motto. Bogdan did, did a trick shot whereby he balanced um, some triangles, I think, on balls. So there'd be three balls with a triangle on it, then another triangle on top of that. And then a member of the audience, generally a not so hefty member of the audience, would stand on top of it. I mean, it was very, very precarious. Uh, and then what Bogdan would do would shoot the cue ball into one of the balls that hold, holding the, um, the racks up. The ball that he hits would fly off and the cue ball would maintain that position so there would be no loss of balance. And it, it worked always well and it was pretty spectacular, but it was one of those things where you, when you looked at it, if it went wrong, it could be potentially dangerous because the kid would then come toppling off the ball and crack his head on the slate of the table and probably break both arms and legs on the floor. So that never happened, thank God, but it was always in the back of our minds. Well, one year we decided to go a step further. He used to get children out of the audience to stand on the triangle on top of the balls. This time he got the presenter out there. He was obviously a little bit bigger, a little bit heavier. He wasn't sure whether it would work, but he was delighted when it worked first time. My last, last and the last shot. Last shot. The pyramid from two triangles and six balls and one person. Mike, help me please. <laughs> this is Phoenix, oh, okay? I've got to stand on that, right? <laughs> yes, please. Oh, no. Bye-bye, <laughs> bye-bye. <laughs> This shot, I make covered eyes. <laughs> Usually, yes, okay. A referee. Yes, something. Yes, yes. No, no, please. Blocking. Oh, all right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No? No. Stop by, stop by. Okay, okay. That's it. Come on. <laughs> Stay. Oh, yeah. Oh, I don't like it. It's all. I don't like hikes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's not, it's not a safe. White ball, white ball. <laughs> It's going, I can feel it going. 50 minutes, 50, yeah. bye. <laughs> <laughs> Red ball, middle 
spent a little bit more English than you let on, didn't you? Eh? <laughs> Take your time. The World Snooker Trick Shot Championship will be greatly missed, but it will live on in our memories as an event with a great mix of laughs, skillful shots, embarrassing misses, obscure props and very willing audience members. This has been the greatest snooker trick shot countdown.